Hi, I'm Deborah Hamilton. Welcome to my podcast, Why Do Pets Matter? Ten years ago, with my iPhone and a script, I recorded the first episode of the Ultimate Pet Resolution Summit, which chatted with experts about conflicts over animals. Our conversations were intimate, honest, and illustrated how disagreements over animals occur and how those disagreements can reshape people's lives and relationships. In November 2019, I started Why Do Pets Matter, a new podcast that continued these informative discussions. I'm so excited to have you here with me, continuing my exploration into a more meaningful conversation about why pets matter to all of us. My guests and I will share ideas, stories, and experiences straight from the heart, unscripted and holistic. From the bravest moments to the most brokenhearted, we will explore how to resolve disagreements over animals differently. One thing I know for sure is I want to have more meaningful conversations that will help all of us unlock that deeply felt human-animal bond that drives the emotions of conflict. Today, we are so lucky to have Olivia Summerhill, a financial planner that helps people going through a divorce. Most people don't put together a plan for their pet pre-disagreement, separation, and divorce. Olivia and I talk about why it's so imperative to have those finances and those agreements in place so that everyone can talk about the best interests of the pet. You certainly don't want your ego or your pride to get in the way of helping your animal. I am so glad that you're here with us. She also has a dog, Leo, but we'll get to that later. Uh, but Olivia, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you help women um, post-divorce on how to really set up their finances. But as we always do here on Why Do Pets Matter, um, for people to figure out why you're here, tell us why pets matter to you. Gosh, that's that's such a question that I think you could answer a million different ways. So I'll go with my first gut instinct, which is joy. So I think that all animals, whatever type you have in your life, so that could be a horse, a dog, cat, fish, doesn't matter. It brings joy. It, it really does. So it's, it's a complete, to me, it's a selfish act is you're getting all this joy and, and they're just there to support you, but you can give them back that joy too. So it's, it's a win-win for everyone, but it's really, it's joy, I think in my mind. So we met over an article I wrote. So tell yeah. the listeners how we actually met. So you wrote an article in Authority Magazine, so Media Magazine, and I had just gotten an interview with them too. And mine was, my article was not going to post for another two months. So of course I'm on uh, the Authority Magazine reading online and I saw yours Yours was all about how to deal with, so five top things in divorce that you need to know and is imperative to know. And you wrote about something that I instantly was shocked and awed by, which is all about the conflict of divorce with animals and separation. That's a topic that I, being newer into the divorce industry, because I've been in wealth management a decade almost, right at a nine, 10 years, and you've been doing something for so much longer and you specialized in something that I had not even thought about. So as someone in that collaborative law, you helping people actually create something better for their animals was fascinating. So I actually reached out to you. That's how we met is I said, Hey, I'm really curious of how did you get into this? And I'd love to hear your success story and also what you do for clients with their animals especially during divorce. So that was- We well, chatted that. about that. It was fabulous. And of oh, course, my, my mantra is, fun. unfortunately, your pet doesn't hate your ex. Exactly. Uh, that was the takeaway. So, yeah. so it, it really, it's important to understand that mm -hmm. pets of divorce should be taken care of yes. in a way that supports the pet. Not that I win or you win, but that yes. the pet wins. And so we had a long conversation. Mm -hmm. And in that conversation, I invited you to be on Why Do Pets Matter? Mm -hmm. Because the finances- of being able to set up the care for your pet may be um, may hinge on the fact that you have a good relationship with your ex so that you can share the costs of the pet. Yes. Well, and that even alluded to the conversation we had about the positivity of you might not be close to that ex, but you not being able to, let's say you're sick and you can't afford something for your own medical needs. And now your dog gets sick. You hating your ex so much that you can't even talk about the financial repercussions of not helping your dog or whatever animal you have. And you being so 
ego and pride driven and not actually thinking about the dog needing financial help and asking your ex, Hey, can you financially help? That's where you came into play where you can actually create those agreements. And that's just so fabulous. Um, so that's a whole topic we could talk about all day is. So I want to go a little deeper into that because you help women yeah. post-divorce mm-hmm. have these conversations and I'm not yeah. sure you've had them yet about the animal, but that would be something that you would hope to be brought in, I would think, uh, yes. even before the divorce so that you can um, help people do the finances and possibly if they can't talk about the animal, they're really um, at odds, having someone like me or someone who does this yeah. for a living come in and have that conversation because a number of my colleagues who I love, uh, divorce attorneys, really don't necessarily understand the depth of um, passion for a pet. Oh, I so agree. It's it's not anything wrong with whoever is drafting anything. It's just, they have a list of things that they need to get done and they're the professional getting it done. So that emotional piece, so I, I've done a lot of work in behavioral finance too, which is all about the neuroeconomics and all about emotions and finance. None of us can just go in and say that we're not emotionally tied to anything money related. And then we add that divorce in there, which is all emotions. So your pet is in the middle of that. So when you're working with the professionals, whether that be you have your divorce mediator, you have someone helping you as a divorce attorney, you have a therapist, hopefully you're working with, hopefully you have a realtor that's helping you with the options of the house. You have that financial professional, you have the accountant, You really, I mean, in all of those relationships, who's talking about the financial end and how are you going to be able to afford taking care of the dog or whatever animal you have? Cat or horse or parrot or something. I was actually going to talk about a lot of clients that have the horses for their kids. So what about the stables? How are you going to afford that? How are you going to have the care and the caretaker of the horses? If you have a, you know, let's say a farm or you have a kid who's going to become the best next thing within the horse races world. I mean, there's a lot of sports that are very expensive that have to do with animals, but it's more to me, it's more the pet, you know? So that's, that's the more emotional. It's not just a, let's get our kid into a sport. It's, it's the pet version. And how are you going to deal with that? And how are you going to set up the right accounts? For me, it's starting small. So talking about it, opening up the conversation, you, for me, at least, I can't say this is what you need to do and let's just, you know, you go do it. You have to actually handhold and say, okay, let's actually now talk about on a different topic. What happens if you're going to actually, during that divorce, it happens where you are supposed to be setting up new beneficiaries post-divorce and you need to actually have something in your will and estate plan that has to do with your animal. You said it to your brother-in-law, you know, verbally to me, you want help, but you're in the middle of a divorce is that what you still want financially? How is someone going to take care of your dog if you pass? So those conversations, getting them to the right people, handholding financially, you have to make those decisions um, in, in, in a, any realm. It doesn't matter if you're in divorce or not. So I know they make these, they have these conversations over animals. And it's interesting you said that because these plans have to be made in your, you know, your estate plans, absolutely your beneficiary plans. Yes. And also you have to have a written plan about that pet because even if you don't like your ex, the pet would like your ex because they don't absolutely. necessarily hate your ex, which you wish they would. But unfortunately, many people say it gets me so angry when I, you know, share my dog or my cat with my ex and the cat and dog are so happy to see them. And I'm so angry because I'm taking care of them. And I said, yes, but try to look at the glasses half full. There's someone on earth that if something happened to you, that dog, cat, bird, horse would not be left in limbo, but rather Mm -hmm. there's someone there. My son actually um, uh, had a breakup and uh, the, his ex was going to take both the cats. And I said to him, that's fine. I said, but make sure that you have a note, something in writing that says if at any time the cats need any help, hers and his, he would help her. And then if at any time she needed to place one or more of the cats, um, she would, give them to him. Mm -hmm. And that didn't work out really well, which was really a good conversation to have because he kept his cat then and she kept her cat. And he still said to her, if something happens to your cat, I'm happy to help financially. Um, 
it, and it, this is something that people don't think about. And often they get so angry and don't do that. This, what I'd like to go to for a minute now is that I posted after a court decision on custody of a pet. Um, there have been two or three or four in New York. And after each one, I go, I really feel uh, that this decision didn't use um, the process in its best way because it said, yes, Olivia gets the dog and Deborah doesn't get the dog. And it was a gay couple. And so Deborah was the moneymaker and Olivia was the stay at home partner. And so when I wrote my article that said, as you probably um, alluded to at the beginning, this is the moneyed spouse who's leaving. You're not giving them any option to be a part of the animal's life. And you, um, if something happens to the pet, what happens to the finances? And a number of people wrote under the article that, well, if they really love the pet, they would pay for the pet's care. And I said, well, I agree. And I'm sure they do. However, the, the process has now put a barrier, not a bridge between having that conversation because they've awarded it to Olivia. I have no, I'm not supposed to have any contact with Olivia. And believe me, I've worked on these cases so often that Olivia would say, I never want to see Deborah again. She drives me nuts. I dislike her, blah, blah, blah. I never want to see her. And I'm going, I get that. And there are a lot of people that don't want to see a lot of people ever again. However, as can be seen in most, you know, even rural areas, but most cities, there are um, cottage industries that have come up that will help you transfer your pet from one person to the other. And if you have a written agreement that says, when I go on vacation, you know, once a month, you know, it's sometimes difficult to get the other every other week because that gets to be really expensive. But if you can find a happy medium where the, the dog or cat or bird or horse is cared for by the other, you, you at least have that bridge if something happens to the animal and you need to have that conversation. I absolutely agree. And I know that when we spoke a few months back, that was something we touched on because I think we're both passionate in that. And you're the person who actually has that power in the room to be able to draft and make those agreements and bridges happen. And it's just when you have that anger and that emotion and you aren't thinking straight, it is so helpful to have a good professional team around you that you trust that can help you control your outcome to a better effect. And that includes the animals of, okay, I'm gonna help you control in, in a positive way of giving you the options. And you really need to think about what's best. And it, I know it's really hard right now, but how do you have that conversation? It has to go slow and easy, but gosh, the animal, again, like you're saying is like, okay, Olivia doesn't have any income and yeah, she's getting the pet. And she never wants to see Deborah again, but why do you think that's best in the courtroom? Why is the judge making that decision? Because there's gonna be an issue within the next 10, 20 years. I mean, that's just granted, she, me, might have a friend who can help, but is that friend gonna really take my dog for a whole month and train him the way that I've trained him and continue to play with him the way I play with him and love him? No, but with Deborah, if we were in a relationship, even if she hated me, I hated her, Deborah's going to be able to care for that animal a lot better. So why isn't that an agreement for a bridge? So I think that that's a great point that you made. So. And, and the piece of information that is is so obvious yet not is that the animal would prefer Deborah over some stranger as well because mm -hmm. they know, you know, yeah. most people buy the dog together. Sometimes they come yes. into relationships with animals. I've just had a case where um, the animal came into the relationship as the relationship started. I've had cases where the dog was there first, the cat was there first. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, if you, if you have a long-term relationship or if you do bond with an animal, um, there are reasons why the animal would be better off if you kept in touch. And then, you know, there are reasons why if, if people uh, don't have the ability to have a, a discussion, there's someone who can help them bridge that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where divorce concierge of like getting to know the right people and networks and the divorce world or knowing who to contact. And that's where the team comes in on, Hey, who do you know that can help help that, that bridging gap. And there's someone who knows someone who can help you with that. So for me, 
I love building my network into everyone. So I just had a conversation with a PI who he does a lot of work with investigative work and helping throughout the relationship, but he also has a whole entire team that helps with the transfer of pets and with humans, so children, so that he watches from behind the scenes that the custody changeover goes well. And that could be each week, each month, whatever it may be. But if that involves animals, I mean, it, it's it's a whole ball game that you can hire the right people if you have the money and support, obviously, to help with that bridging gap. So if you really you know, want to have that done, you can make it happen. It just, knowledge is power. You don't know what you don't know. I hear that a lot right now, but that's why you have that team to help you professionally or you read stuff like what you're writing. I mean, my gosh, you can learn so much and you don't have to have the money to pay to talk to you, Deborah, for however much it is an hour. You can read up on stuff and learn and then reach out when the time is right. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the money you spend up front really will serve you going forward. I think forward. so, too. Yes, you know, it, 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 while you're deciding, instead of having it one-sided, you yes. ask. And so as as far as teams are concerned, I know this is why do pets matter, but there is someone in your life who matters a great deal, who's a team member of yours in triathlon. So I'd love for you to share with the audience who that triathlete is. <laughs> So I have a dog named Leo and he is a hundred pound puppy, um, pure muscle, just a great dog. And I got him specifically, as you stated for my triathlon buddy. So I am married. I have a wonderful husband, but he does not care to get up at four in the morning to go run miles and miles. So I properly planned and it has to be a joint decision. I think that's key. So if you're in a relationship, please just don't show up on Christmas with a puppy or don't show up with something you think the other wants or you want and not the other person wants or they're allergic. Has to be communicating. You know, you have to communicate. But we spent, it was years of, okay, we're in an apartment. It's not the right time. It's not the right time, downtown Seattle. And we finally got the house with the yard just because I knew we we're getting a dog. It's very clear. And then we researched for another year or two just on what type of breed that can run long miles. And it's it's a good thing for them. They're not going to be like a pug who does not want to go with me. So long story short, we finally made the decision and got a Rhodesian Ridge back. And it was the best, best breed for me. So he is my partner in crime every day. So I know I love that. And I love that you said that your husband isn't a triathlete, but I'm sure his relationship with Leo oh. is just as incredible as yours. It's just like incredibly different. So tell yes. us a little bit. So you run and you, does, does Leo swim too? No, he, no, actually we, we do. Um, so we trained with, there's a dog spa where I'm in Seattle and it's an indoor pool for dogs. And there's a therapy, I guess she's a therapist. Uh, a therapist. Oh yes. Water therapy for dogs. A water therapy. Yes. yes. Right. Yes. Yep. For older dogs and for younger yep. dogs and Rhodesian Ridgebacks. They're not water dogs, but we got them in a life vest and we had toys all in the pool. And the lady obviously is so good with dogs. So we got him used to water very, very quickly so that he would learn that it's a good thing and it's in a warm spa. It's very, very, he's our kid, right? It's Leo. Um, and then we transitioned him slowly into getting into lakes so that he'd be comfortable yeah, swimming. In Northwest, I forgot to say that yes. Olivia is in um, Seattle. Yes. Seattle. And it, I was going to say Seattle. I get Seattle and Portland um, mixed up. Uh, and uh, so the water there, the Pacific water there is a little chilly. In the winter time it is. And we said we would never buy vests or anything for our dog. You know, we're not going to go get Christmas outfits for him, but we have gotten the appropriate water yep. and the, the appropriate clothes. And we don't put them in water. That's too cold, but we do absolutely in the summer. It's not, and, and even fall and spring, it's not, it's more mild than you'd think. Um, so but proper yeah, they're, they're a smooth coated dog. So they dry easily as opposed to the yes. uh, double coated dogs, but yes. the double coated dogs, funny poodles say, um, have actually that insulation layer mm -hmm. uh, just for everyone who's listening. Do you know why poodles at the dog show have those pom-poms? It's not because it's a beauty thing. When they were used to do what they did, which was jump off boats and retrieve uh, fish and other things from uh, the water, 
uh, that was the part of their body that would get cold. So they would leave those pom-poms on their hips, on their chest, around their chest, on their ears, because that would keep them from getting frostbitten. Great facts to know. Great. Yeah. Everyone on listening, always, I'm sure learned. I always love to give good facts, but Rhodesians, as you said, they're African dogs. So mm-hmm. not a lot of Pacific water nearby. Um, so they're warm weather dogs. They, they survive heat really well. Maybe not humidity, but heat really well. Uh, so he's your buddy. So describe for us a day um, with Leo with you and a day with Leo with your husband. Great. So that's... <laughs> So also doing the research of Rhodesian Ridgebacks, they're very good at going full speed. You know, they can run forever. And then they're also the breed that will sit on a couch and not move forever. So it works perfectly in our relationship because for me in a day in the life with Leo is, hey, let's get up. Let's put on our little headlights. He has his vests that are all shining in different colors because it's dark and we're going to go for a run and I'm going to make sure my dog doesn't get hit because that would be tragic. So we're, we're both lit up. We're both ready to go. It's dark and we go for six to eight miles. And that took a year and a half to get to six to eight miles. I'm so glad you said that because I always talk about it when I see people running with their Oh, Oh, and the puppy will stay running with you. And you have no idea the damage you're doing to their adult bones. It is terrifying. Um, the puppy is running with you because he's scared you're going to leave him and you're his mom. So that's the only reason why the puppy is continuing to stay with you. Sure, he'll like come home and sleep, but he is really blowing out his cruciate and he's yes. ruining his hips and all other things. Yes. So that's, we've hired the best of the best trainers since he came home with us because we wanted to make sure we weren't making mistakes, training him inappropriately. And one of those things is we knew he was going to be doing triathlons, but we need to train him appropriately to get to that level. We're not going to start him as a puppy, especially larger breeds, their hips, their joints. You cannot push that. So you need to walk a little bit, walk a little bit, resting, do that for a few weeks, then a few weeks do maybe a mile walking faster pace. I mean, it takes an entire year and a half to get to even a few miles. And now it's at six to eight. I have not pushed him. Yeah, he's three at 18 months. He was doing about a mile and, and yes. you worked him up to that. It, yes. It's so intuitive because if you were doing it yourself, you wouldn't go out and run five miles if you had never run before and puppies have never run before. And what people don't understand, they go, yeah, but my dog runs around the backyard like a whirly yep. dervish. And so I'm just channeling him and I'm going, yes, but he stopped. He doesn't run. He stops. He runs. He stops. He falls mm-hmm. down. He rolls over, especially when they're puppies. You know, their legs are they, they go everywhere. So you, you really you did it the right way because it's so important if you want him to be a long term companion with you on these triathlons, building him up. So he builds up his bone strength, his mm-hmm. muscle strength his you know, ligaments and tendon strength. Mm-hmm. It really is imperative to do it slow and steady, Eddie. Yep. And with his vet, we make sure that we have the proper nutrition and the proper supplements because glucosamine, he needs a lot extra because he is a large breed dog. So, and we just want to make sure that he is long-term healthy. So I'm in my financial professional, I'm very much a planner in my personal life. I'm a planner too. Long-term is more successful. I want my dog to be long-term. That's important to me. So in my day, Going back to that, we run, we have a good breakfast. So that's another thing is that if I know I'm going to be running first thing in the morning, I don't want to feed him a full meal right before he goes out because that's going to hurt him. That's harmful. That causes bloat potentially. Um, So all the little things that you want to do to protect the dog because he can't speak to you and say, this is what's happening, mom. Um, He rests. I work a little. We go on a nice little walk. It's 15, 25 minutes the most just for fun to get out in the daytime when it's actually light out. Um, And midday, I typically am working. And then we go on another 15, 25 minute walk in the afternoon. The husband comes home because I work remote. So I've been with Leo all day. He gets to play a little with the husband, but when Sam gets to be with the dog, it's let's watch some football. Let's stay on the couch. Let's have a good morning. You know, (laughs) it's just, let's give you a little extra here on the food end. So it's a totally different relationship, but it's really works because Leo needs that too. So he needs to be able to say, okay, mom, I don't need to get off the couch right now. Let's just chill out for a little bit with dad. He can, you know, eat chips and dip and uh, wear the uh, appropriate uh, sports gear. You know, for the team he's pushing for, I have a friend who has Irish setters and 
her collars change with the seasons and oh, with I love it. Um, because you know you have to have the appropriate garb. Um, you do. <laughs> so it's interesting. And, and so Leo looks forward to his time with you. Uh-huh. And, and as you just said, which I love, he looks forward to his time with your husband. Where Absolutely. He looks couch and says, have a nice run, mom. Yes, yes. It does not have to be 100% consistent with one person or the other. It's just, it's really good to mix it up, I think. And I'm the type who is that type A, let's do everything the same. But with the dog, no, it doesn't need to be every single day. So it, it works. It I mean, really they well. like routine, but yes. not so much. It's interesting because my dogs love my husband when I'm not here. But when I'm here, uh, they, they really stick with me and my husband goes you know you're such a fair weather friend and what he does at our house i don't know if your husband does anything like this but at our house uh, my husband goes to the ice maker oh and the noise of the ice maker makes everybody get up and run and sit at attention in front of the ice maker because they love ice cubes Mm -hmm. and uh if if roxy i only have one with me now uh if roxy doesn't come out he will call from the kitchen turncoat I have ice here for you, you know, and, and I feel so bad, but she's like, I'm sleeping. I love it. You know, uh, Leo is three, right? He's two and he's about two. So, yeah. So so Leo might slow down a little when he's like eight or nine. And so when you're going for a run, um, he may or may not be saying I'm right there with you. You may have to slow down your runs because when you're training them and when they're young, that's a whole different thing and then when they get older so in in the irish setter world we go to field trialing and it's Mm -hmm. and dog shows and when the dogs get older and and we're grooming everybody getting them ready to go to the dog show uh the old snow faces as we call them or sugar faces as we call them go excuse me um i need my nails ground i need my ears done i need you know i need everything done (laughs) And I'll put them up on the table and they will get off and they will be, okay, here I am. And when I put the dogs in the car, they'll stand there and I'll go, no, no, you're not going this time. And it rips my heart out. So I will forewarn you that when you know better than to take uh, Leo on a, on a run many years from now, it will be the, and call me, I'll, I'll walk I you. Will. It will be the hardest thing because you have to make the decision like you did at the beginning to mm-hmm. bring him up to speed you have to um, make the decision to then retire him Mm -hmm. in a way that still makes him feel that he's important, you know, take Mm -hmm. him for a Mm -hmm. half a mile run or just whatever. Uh, But you really need to make sure, I mean, people, when you're thinking about your animals, the, their whole entire life is never long enough. Mm -hmm. And what you, what you need to prepare for is that you are going to be there to keep them safe, no matter what. I, I really, yeah, I appreciate you saying that. And I probably will call you because it will be very hard, but doing what's in the best interest of the dog or the animal, that's, that will be really difficult. Cause even before COVID we wanted to make sure he was acclimated with people and make sure he's socialized. So we would have people come walk him. So on the, the dog apps, there's, you know, great ones, Rover, whatever you may use, And even though I'm working from home and I can go walk him, I would have someone come just to walk him for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And I pay, I think in Seattle, it's a lot more expensive than other places. Maybe New York is even more expensive, but it's expensive, but it was worth it because he got to have that exercise with someone else. And as Leo gets older, continuing to do things in creative ways that can help them prolong or at least be happy, but you're not pushing them. I'll have to do that in reverse again. And I, I think little walks here and there will be again, something I bring up with him is just well, to I get love him outside. You said that because that's part of what we talked about before we got on the air, which is making a plan for the care of your pet long-term. Ooh, short-term. Yes. Because hello, you know, you're doing the finances, you're doing the long-term planning um, post-divorce you know, what happens to that pet if something happens to someone? Mm-hmm. We talked about it a little at the beginning, so we're coming full circle. Mm-hmm. But quite frankly, you really need to introduce them to people who might be your backup. And I will say just mm-hmm. one or two things about the map plan, which is you need to appoint caregivers. So when you have the dog walkers, I can say from personal experience, uh, when my husband broke his shoulder, I was so grateful I had my map plan and my caregivers uh, situated and set 
met up and they knew each other because they came over and helped me with the dogs because I had many of them then. They came over and helped me with the dogs while I helped my husband. And the reason I built the map plate is because I broke my ankle and my husband told me on no uncertain terms, uh, and I had nine dogs, I'm taking care of you, not the dogs. And I realized that was probably not a singular problem that people who had many dogs, who show dogs, as I show my Irish setters, um, have. That their spouses may or may not, like your husband doesn't do triathlons, right? So my husband doesn't show dogs, but I show dogs and he supports me showing dogs and he cheers for me all the time and tells everybody about, you know, the last win or whatever. Uh, but yet he wasn't really a desirous of, like your husband isn't desirous of doing triathlons. Um, he's not desirous of caring for the dogs. He'll let them in and out, but that's about it. And really that had worked for me until I broke my ankle and realized, holy Toledo. And I had talked to people um, about taking care of the dogs, but they were unable to care for them. <clears throat> so I sat there and went, boy, I, first of all, I need something written down. I need to have everybody in line to take care of my pets. And I need to let them know who the person is who's taking care of my pets. So you have a dog walker. So your husband knows Joe, the dog walker. You know Joe, the dog walker. And Joe knows both of you. And then maybe you'll have Steve, the dog walker, and, and Mary Lou, the dog walker, uh, so that if something happens, they know your dog and your dog knows them. Because my biggest fear when I tell people, you know, have people come over and care for dogs, especially during COVID, because people's dogs were being taken out of their house mm -hmm. because they had no plan. Nobody knew what to do with the dogs. They took them to animal care and control. And that would be terrible um, for, for Leo if he was taking animal care and control because, you know, one or both of you were involved in something that you couldn't come home. And so you, you, you sit there and you just say, wow, I need to make sure I leave a note for the animal care and control guys that this dog doesn't leave, um, especially during COVID when I first did the map plan, I said, well, you know, you can have anybody come and they'll be there in a few hours, just leave the note up. Well, when states were shut down, that made it a little more difficult. So there are different ways you can get people local um, and far away to care for your dogs. But it, you made a perfect point in that it really is um, necessary to both plan for the beginning of your life with your pet and plan for the end of life with pets um, and plan for something that happens that you can't, you know, necessarily perceive. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the map is good. And I think we have to just distinguish that it needs to be also in writing so that, and you have to communicate to the other people that if they're out of state or in state, they know that they're a part of this team. So I can't just say, Oh, Sue or Joe, the dog walker is knows Leo so well. I'm, I'm not going to write that down. I'm just going to say it to my husband. Well, if we both are out of town, somehow we're not back and we haven't even told Sue or Joe, Hey, you know, you're a part of this team or our dog, you know, we have dog trainers or they're, you know, not aware it's not going to work out so well. And that goes into financial planning. If you don't tell people what you want, or when we talk about this and getting into the, the not so fun conversation is the estate plan and that plan, you need to have that with an estate attorney, you know, trusted source of person who can help you through this make those right decisions about what to do with your pet yeah. if you're incapacitated. So it doesn't mean you died, but who's going to help feed your dog and take care of your animal if you're not there. So all this stuff needs to be in writing and the people who are involved need to know they're a part of it. So for example, I have a family member who we have something saying if both Sam and I are gone, you know, she already now knows she's, she's accepted it. We've written it down. She's communicating. So it's not a surprise to her of, Hey, you're all of a sudden getting an animal post our death. She's aware. So, and another thing I'll throw in there is what I see in my world of finances, people always put their sibling and, you know, they, they think that's the best trustee or that's the best person to care for their animal, but remember age. So if you're 80 years old or 70 years old, do you think that your brother, sister, who might be older than you really wants to take care of your pet? So make sure you communicate and you talk to them about if you're putting them in your will or whatever your map plan, you really want to make sure that's clear. Um, I always have the energy. Yeah. I always love redundancy because, you know, I might say to my sister, cause I know she wants me to take her pet. Oh yeah, sure. But I really don't want her pet. And I'm not going to say that to her because she might be leaving me some money. And if I say that to her, then I won't get that money. So what I usually do is say you need at least three so that. Um, oh, good idea. And there could be check and balance because, you know, it's supposed to go to Deborah first. But if Deborah doesn't want the dog, then 
Deborah knows that Susie and Mary Lou are watching. So mm-hmm. she either call keeps the dog or she calls Sue or Mary Lou and says, you know, I really can't keep the dog. I just moved into a no pet building. I can't keep the dog, whatever. And so they take care of the dog. So this is a whole nother conversation. I am so grateful. We have been able to talk. Uh, I'm so grateful. All of you have stayed on the podcast to listen to Olivia and I talk about so many wonderful things. Let's see. The first was why do pets matter? Because of the joy they bring to you. The second is, listen, as, as a finance specialist, you need to really talk about the finances around the dog. And lastly, if you want a dog in your life, plan for that dog and make sure you bring it into your life in a way that suits you and anyone else who's living with you. It shouldn't be an independent decision. It should be because that pet really is going to be a part of everyone's life. So Olivia, I'm so thrilled. I know I'm going to have you back because God, we have to talk about so much. I, the, the, the writing down is what is so key. And I know in financial planning, um, writing things down is key. That's also in um, pet planning is really, so uh, it really is very, very important. The Why Do Pets Matter podcast drops every Thursday and can be found on whichever platform you find your podcasts. Subscribe now, invite your friends, and I cannot wait to have you join me in these conversations.